We, uh, I, I failed to mention this earlier because I just saw him, but we have a first-timer here today at South Point, and uh, I guess she's in here, Amelia Cannon and Alice and Hannah Cannon's new baby. Oh, yeah, I, I see her now back there, and uh, beautiful baby girl, so good to have you guys back in today. You, you've probably heard the story, but you know, it was a terrible flood out in the northwest, and a little town located between two rivers, and the Floods kept coming and the rivers kept rising. There was an old man that lived in a house in between the two rivers. And finally the rivers overflowed and it was just covering the land in between the two in this old man's house. And they were evacuating the little town, told everybody to get out and, you know, while they could. And <clears throat> this old man refused to leave. He was like, no. Nope. He said, I'm praying. I trust God is going to save me. He's going to deliver me. And they said, look, you know, you, you can't stay here. And he said, no, leave me alone. So finally, roads become impassable, and this four-wheel drive, big old pickup truck comes by, and the guy yells out. He says, come on, old man. He said, you need to get in the truck. Roads are impassable. You need to get out before it floods. He said, no, you go on. He said, I've prayed God's going to rescue me. He's going to take care of me. Waters start rising, and finally, the, the guy gets on top of his dining room table. Water's in the house. And the water's flowing through, and he's on his dining room table, and a guy comes by in a rowboat, and he pulls up next to the dining room window, looks in, yells at him. He says, hey, man, come on, get in the boat. He said, it's flooding, you're going to die. He said, it's going to take everything away. And the guy says, oh, no, you go on, go on. He said, I prayed, I trust God, he's going to save me, he's going to rescue me. Well, finally, the water rises so high that he has to get up on the roof of his house. And the water's just sweeping away everything, and he's up on the roof of the house, and Finally, they send a helicopter, and it's hovering over the house, and the guy speaks over the loudspeaker, and he says, you know, here, grab the rope. This is your last chance. We're trying to get you to safety. We've come to take you to, to rescue you and, and carry you off. And he's like, no, you get out of here. He said, you're going to blow me off the roof. He said, I've prayed. I trusted God, and God's going to rescue me. Well, the helicopter left, and within a few minutes, the flood swept the house away. Man died. He's at the pearly gates. He gets to the pearly gates, and he said, I've got one question. He said, God, I prayed, I trusted you that you were going to rescue me in the flood, and, and yet, here I am. I didn't make it. Why? God says, hey, my child, I heard your prayer the first time. He said, I sent a four-wheel drive truck, I sent a rowboat and a helicopter, and you refused them all. I think sometimes that's kind of like us, isn't it? You know, I, I love what first responders stand for. I love how they serve our community. And I, I've experienced several interactions with first responders here as well as in other places. And I, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I was in a, a very bad wreck in Atlanta one time just around the airport. Kenny Wirtz was with me, and there was a fatality. And I was much younger then and just really shook up, didn't know what to do. And the first responders at Camp Creek around the airport in Atlanta, they came and they took care of everything, took us to the firehouse, cleaned us up. The, the police chief there of Camp Creek sat down with us. And I mean, they went above and beyond anything they could have ever done that was expected of them. And in fact, I went back by there a few months later just to tell them thank you because they just... They served so well and did, did their job so well. Uh, and, and I've had small things. Uh, my father was ill and fell during the night. And I thought, hey, you know, I'm young. I can pick him up. I can get him. And I couldn't. And we had to call and wake up some, some fire and paramedics one night just to come help me get my father back in the bed. And uh, so they serve. They, they serve out of self, unselfishness, service. And there's been a few times that I've had to be rescued um, that we've had to be rescued. I remember my wife, we went snow skiing, snowshoe West Virginia. We went down an expert slope, and uh, me and, and Kenny made it to the bottom, and Matt, I think, was coming down with Marie down the slope. And we get to the bottom, we get in the chairlift, and we're starting back up to the top of the mountain, going over the slope, and we hear this commotion, this, I'm no, you know, and just going on, and we're like, who is that lady, and what is she so upset about? And as we get a little further up the slope, Kenny punched me. He said, is that your wife? 
And I'm like, oh my gosh. And she had fallen and, and was having a hard time getting up on this real steep and icy slope. And the ski patrol was there and they were trying to help her. And she's like, I just want to get off this mountain. Yeah, you know, she was, and Matt looked like a deer in the headlights. He didn't know what to do with her. So, you know, and we're going up this chairlift and had to be rescued by ski patrol. There have been a few times. I, I was actually hanging a wreath for Christmas back here in this little loft. And, and everybody here knows I don't do heights. I actually got up there hang a wreath. My wife was telling me where to put it and how to hang it. And I got up there and hung it, had a lean uh, extension ladder up there. And when I got it hung, it was time to get off. I couldn't step over that rail. I would get just a little bit and I just fear gripped me. And I was just like, I can't, I can't do it. And she said, you, you got up there, you can get down, you know, just. And so we, we stood there. And finally, it was to the point, literally to the point, I said, you're going to have to call. How embarrassing will this be? But you're going to have to call the fire department and they're going to have to come get me off of this loft because I can't make that step over the rail and get back on that ladder again. So, we, you know, we all have to be rescued at times. There's some amazing stories in our, in our world of, of first responders and rescues. And I, I think, you know, one of the, the big uh, rescues, some of the ones that, that kind of stood out to me, was I, I thought about first responders. And if you remember back uh, in 2009, a pilot by the name of uh, Chesley Sullenberger, Sully, landed a plane in the Hudson River with no casualties. And they landed, and the immediate response of police boats, Coast Guard, fire boats, got out there, and every single person on that plane was rescued. I think about other stories, and one from way back in 1987, uh, Jessica McClure fell down a well in Texas, 22 foot down a well and was in there for almost two days before they could actually dig a hole and rescue her. I watched this on national news. You may have seen it too. But they rescued the first responders. They were able to get this little girl out of that well and get her out safely. And then I think about the Chile mine disaster with the 33 miners who were in a collapsed mine for two months. People were round the clock, nonstop, until all 33 of these miners came out of that mine. A lot of other stories that we could talk about. Katrina, Michael, just recently. And then who could ever forget 9-11. The heroic men and women who charged into danger. And many lost their lives in saving other people's lives. Real life stories. These are real life stories, and they make for, for great movies, and we watch the movies, and we're stirred, and we go, wow, that's... But I think about how many stories never get put into a movie, how many stories never get put into a book, how many stories probably happen right here in our community of heroism, and people being rescued that never make the headlines. How many of those stories happen? They put themselves in harm's way to ensure the safety and well-being of other people. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of stories that could be shared today of what they've seen, what they've heard, what they, they've done. And the fact is, most of us need rescuing at some point in our life. We've either fallen and need someone to help us back up, or a loved one has fallen, we heard an intruder, someone came in the house, or we just heard a noise and we call somebody to come check out the noise, or... You know, maybe we had an accident. Maybe we were stranded on the side of the road. Maybe the house caught fire. Maybe we felt a pain in our chest or a twinge in our chest that we weren't familiar with. And someone came to our rescue. Come, someone came to help us. Or how about this one? Maybe you've been in a hurry. And you've been maneuvering around all those idiots ill-equipped to drive on the highways. And you're in a hurry, and you're flying along, and suddenly some blue lights appear in your rearview mirror. And they're there to rescue you, actually, from doing something that could turn out to be very fatal or harmful. I remember one story of us being rescued in, on our honeymoon. This was 30, almost 35 and a half years ago. I took my wife to the Poconos for the honeymoon, and coming home, I said, hey, baby, I'm a young guy, you know, real young. I said, hey, baby, I'm going to show you the world. I'm going to show you the, the country. So we drove back. I'm going to carry you through New York City, baby. Nothing but the best for you. So we start our journey home, and we go through New York City. And I'm driving down, you know, in all these lanes and all this traffic and all, you know, just 
going along, and I don't know how it happened, but somehow we got forced off on an exit in Brooklyn. So we're down close to the docks in Brooklyn. If you've ever been to the docks in Brooklyn, you know it's not a good place to be. And I saw with my eyes what I'd only seen on television shows previously of people living in boxes and, and, and street walkers and deals going on. I mean, it was all happening right there, right in front of And we're just like, you know, here we are from little old southern sweet home Alabama, and here we are in the middle of this neighborhood, and we couldn't get out. We couldn't find our way back to the interstate. And we drove several blocks around and couldn't find it. And finally, I saw two police officers. And these two police officers were, were like walking a beat, and, and, and these guys had their guns like the old westerns. They had it strapped down, you know, hanging low. One of them's shirt was buttoned on there and long hair and had their hat on. And, and I was almost scared to go up to them, but we, we finally flagged them out and said, look, please, sir, we are lost and we can't find our way back to the interstate. And this officer looked at his other officer. He said, can you tell them how to get back over to the interstate? He said, I, I'm not sure. He said, let and their patrol car was about a half a block away. He said, hang on a minute. They walked down their patrol car, got a map out, laid it on the hood of the car, and they walked down there, and they started looking. They said, okay, now if you take this road here and go, and they, we were actually about four blocks from the interstate, but they got us out of there, and I'm eternally thankful for these officers who rescued us that day. They not only rescued us from something that dangerous that could have happened, they saved my marriage. They actually saved my marriage on my honeymoon. We all need rescuing. When someone comes into our situation or our crisis and they do for us what we can't do for ourselves, who step into danger, who place themselves in harm's way in order to protect us. You know, there's some incredible search and rescue stories in the Bible as well. One particular occasion, a woman was caught in the very act of adultery and all the religious people came and threw her at Jesus' feet. They had rocks in their hands. Because the law said you were supposed to stone them, kill them. And they threw this woman at Jesus' feet and they said, Jesus, she was caught in that. She's guilty. And the law says we throw rocks. What do you say? I love Jesus. You know, he gets down and he starts doodling in the sand. I don't know what he's doing, but when he raises up, he says, okay. The one of you that don't have any sin, you throw the first stone. And he goes back down in the sand, riding in the sand. One by one, they drop their rocks, they leave. Jesus looks up at her. He said, where's the people that wanted to stone you? She said, they're gone. He said, look, don't do this again. Go and sin no more. He rescued, literally rescued this woman. Disciples are in a boat in a storm. The boat's about to sink. They're out in the middle of the night. And these are experienced fishermen, and they... Just waves are coming over the boat. They're scared. It said they feared for their life. And all of a sudden they look and Jesus is walking on the water in the middle of the night. And he gets to their boat and he speaks to the wind and the waves and they settle. He just rescued his disciples. You see, Jesus devoted a whole chapter in Luke about search and rescue. In Luke 15, he tells Three stories, back to back to back. First time in Scripture that he, he did something like that where he just told three stories back to back. And he said the first one is about a, a lost coin. Second one is about a lost sheep. And the third one that you're probably more familiar with was about a lost son, a, a prodigal son. And we talked about that last week. But he said there was a, 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 all the notorious sinners, Jesus was hanging out with them and, and having dinner with them and, and, and just hanging out with them. And all the religious people got real irritated with Jesus. They said, why are you associating with people like that? Why do you hang out with, with people like that? So Jesus said, well, to answer your question, let me give you a story. And there's a common thread that runs through all these stories. And that common thread that runs through these stories that Jesus told was that something of great value was lost. And here's how the story, here, here's the story Jesus tells. He says, a, a woman had ten silver coins. If she loses one coin, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls other, her women friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me because I have found the silver coin that I lost. He said, I tell you in the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. In both stories, something of great value was lost. 
This Palestinian woman, she received 10 silver coins at her wedding as a wedding gift. Kind of like we give wedding bands. This is what the 10 coins represented. And she had these 10 silver coins. They usually wore it in a band on their head, the 10 coins. And it said if she lost one, not only would it be kind of an embarrassment to walk around and everybody's go, oh, you, you, you're missing a coin, you know. Oh, duh, tell me, I lost it. He said not only would it be an embarrassment to her if she lost one of these, these coins, but they had great sentimental value. It was kind of like her inheritance. It was kind of like her financial future, these 10 silver coins. And she lost one of them. The next story Jesus told, it kind of revolved in a different story. It revolved around a shepherd who had 100 sheep. And he said he had 100 sheep, and one of the sheep decided to wander off. Just got lost, just started grazing and never looked up, and pretty soon the sheep was lost, and the shepherd had lost track of the sheep. And Jesus told the story. He said, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go and search for the, that one until, he, until the lost, he finds the lost one, until he finds that one that is missing? And then he said, if when he does, he said he'll carry it home on his shoulders. And he'll be joyful. He'll, when he arrives, he'll call together his friends and neighbors. And he'll say, hey guys, rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. Both stories, something of great value was, was lost and deserved an all-out search. No doubt the woman turned her house upside down. Anybody ever lost keys before? I haven't, you know, but I mean, I'm sure somebody here has. Actually, I have. And we turn the house up, though, where's my keys? You know, and we're throwing stuff around. And, and that's what this woman, she's like, where's my coin? And she lights a lamp, and she sweeps the house out, and she does all this stuff, searching for that one coin. Took every rug up, shook every rug, and moved all the furniture till she found the coin that was missing. The shepherd, he left the safety of the camp and traveled out into dangerous territories in search of that one sheep, that one sheep that was missing. And once they found these objects that were missing, it said they threw a party. They rejoiced because they had found what was lost. And the point Jesus was making with these stories is just as the shepherd and the woman sought for what was lost, this was the point Jesus was trying to get across. He said, so God searches for those who are lost. That God searches for those who are lost. But by far the greatest rescue story is a story that every one of us this morning have in common. It's a story that we all have in common, and that is that God rescued fallen man. That Jesus came to our rescue. The problem was, was sin. We were all born with it. We all had sin, and it separated us from God. And as hard as we try to save ourselves, we couldn't find our way back. We couldn't seem to rescue ourselves, and we found ourselves lost and distant from God. Perhaps we just lost our way. Maybe we just got busy and just wasn't paying attention, and we just woke up one day and go, man, I'm so far from where I should have been or where I need to be or where I once was. Or maybe we just wandered off, or maybe we just intentionally ran off, like, hey, I'm done with this, and, and I'm going to go in the opposite direction. Regardless of how we got there, we're lost and we're in need of being rescued. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that God doesn't shrug his shoulders at the thought of one missing person. Or he doesn't pick and choose and say, well, that person's not really worth searching for or rescuing. Because in reality, I was that one person. In reality, I was the one sheep. and In reality, I was the one out of ten coins that was lost. I'm glad God never says, well, they should have chose a different path. Or they should have known better. Or I told them so. Or if they would straighten up, then I would rescue them. Now listen, listen to me. He never stops searching for what is lost. Never. In fact, he launches an all-out search, ready to sacrifice himself to bring back all those that are lost and in need of Him. There's, there's no place too far. There's no place too dark. There's no life that is too broken. There's no life that has been totally messed up. There's no place that God will not search for us and rescue us. In fact, I love these words found in Ezekiel. He said, I will seek my lost ones, 
those who strayed away and bring them safely home again. I'll put splints and and bandages upon their broken limbs and will heal the sick. As hard as we try to save ourselves, we can't. We can't be good enough. We can't say, well, I'm going to be a better person. We can't go to church enough. We can't read our Bible enough. We can't treat everyone fair enough. We can't do enough good things. Our best efforts could not solve our sin problem and bring us back into a relationship with God. I thought it was interesting. I read on lifeguards one time, and they were talking about their training and what they go through and how they rescue people. And it was interesting that they made this comment. They said, the hardest person to save is the person who's trying to save themselves. The hardest person to save is the person who's trying to save themselves. And the lifeguards relate into that. They say they'll, they, will, they will grab onto you, they'll put your head down to try to keep their head above water. They'll do whatever they got to do to try to save themselves. And therefore, lifeguards come up from behind a victim to try to rescue them instead of coming in front of them. Because they said you can't save someone who's trying to save themselves. So if we can't be good enough to save ourselves, then we need a Savior, don't we? Someone to do for us what we can't do for ourselves, and that's exactly why Jesus came. In fact, Jesus' own words in Luke's Gospel, he said this, John, he said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to search for and rescue man because we couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't do what needed to be done ourselves. And people often say, well, I don't need all that religious stuff. I don't need Jesus. I don't need that, that whole Bible stuff. Or, or I'm not that bad after all. I'm generally a good person. I try to do good. Let me tell you, here's the response Paul had to that. Paul said, there is none righteous. And you go, well, but I'm pretty good. You know, I, I try to do good and I, 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 I do this and I do that. And Paul said, no, there's, there's none, none, absolutely zero. None are righteous. There's not a single good one among us. We say, well, I'm pretty uh, good compared to, you know, Sam over here. You, you know how Sam is, and you know what he does and how he lives. I'm pretty good compared to Sam, or I'm pretty good compared to Sally. You know, Sally lives a pretty loose life, and then compared to Sally, I'm a pretty good person. And that's fine, but here's the problem. We don't compare to Sally or Sam. We compare to Jesus. And I don't know about you, but when I compare myself to Jesus, that just kind of takes the blocks out from under me because I know I'm not righteous. I know I'm not good enough. I know I don't compare well to, to the one who is righteous. I don't measure up very well against that. In fact, I'm doomed if I've got to measure up to Jesus. And Jesus said, that's exactly why I came. Scripture says for everyone, you, me, everyone has sinned and we fall short of God's righteousness. We fall short of God's glorious standards. You say, I don't need someone today telling me how bad I am. I already know that. Listen, he's not searching and seeking and trying to rescue us to condemn us. He's trying to do it to save us. You know, when these guys run into a burning house and pull somebody out, they don't pull them out and go, well, you shouldn't have been playing with Matt. You know, you shouldn't have started that. You know, they don't pull them out to condemn them. They pull them out to rescue them, to save them. And Jesus said, I came not to tell you how bad you were. He said, I came to rescue you. I came to save you. I came to give you life. God knew that because of sin, the world was going to swallow us up. And like the flood we talked about at the very beginning with the old man, he knew that this problem with sin in the world would become increasingly more and more evil and leading us farther and farther away from where he intended. But because we're so valuable to God, and he loves us so much, he wouldn't sit idly by and say, hey, I hope you make it. Hey, it's, it's pretty evil out there. I hope you, good luck with that. I hope you can swim. Rather than saying that, he said, no, I'll send my son 
into the world. To search for and to rescue and bring safely back into a relationship with God. And I love this verse found in Galatians 1.4. Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. What started out as a silly story about a man who refused to be rescued and was swept away by a flood because he didn't recognize those sent to rescue him. I encourage you today, please don't miss the one who came to rescue you. They tell us in an emergency to pick our phone up and call 911. I've done that a few times and people are there and respond. But if you feel lost and distanced from God today, I encourage you to call 316. And 316 simply says, God loves you so much that He sent Jesus to rescue you. That if you simply put your trust in Him, you will not perish, but you'll have everlasting life. Father,